Good evening. Welcome everybody to Peter Singer's lecture on population growth, organized by Radboud Reflects. I'm Maite Chonahi, I'm the moderator for tonight. I can't see everybody of you, but I know that you've come in huge numbers. Uh, we're very happy to have Peter Singer here and to have you here. Um, we rarely see so much interest in a speaker as we see tonight. Uh, you've came in such great numbers, we had to change venue. And uh, Peter Singer has been doing interviews with the Dutch press all day. Um, in a minute, uh, Han Krieke, the Vice-Chancellor, or Rector Magnificus, as we say, of the Radboud University, will give a brief introduction of Peter Singer. Um, so I will just state some practicalities for tonight. Um, yes, as you see, I'm doing the opening right now. Um, and uh, further, it's a pretty straightforward program. Uh, Peter Singer will have his lecture for about 45 minutes. Um, after which Mr. Singer and I will have a brief conversation and then we will give the floor to you because I'm sure you'll have plenty of questions or um, remarks. Um, we will close the night at 9 uh, o'clock and Peter Singer will be available to sign some books if you want. I can't wait to get started so I'll give the floor to Han Krieken. Have a nice evening. Good evening indeed, and uh, very welcome on behalf of Radboud Reflex and Radboud University on this what's going to be a very interesting evening. And indeed you are with very, very many people. I hope it's not too many people. I don't think now it's too many people, but at the end of the e evening I might. Uh, but the solution we ha will have for that, uh, we have to think about, of course. Um, I think it's a very appropriate moment to have Peter Singer here in the Netherlands, but also abroad, we face a lot of large societal issues. And in the Netherlands, the approach is to solve that mainly by technology. You may have heard that the extra money our government gives for research goes mainly to technology. And last Friday, I was talking with one of the prime engineers of the Netherlands, and I said, you know, it's not only the engineers that can solve the problems. Well, he said, well, most of we can. And there is great trust in technology and in the engineers. And I explained to him that I once saw the movie, and many of you have may have seen it, of this bridge in the United States, which was built, and then the wind gave resonance, and this bridge started wumbling, and then it broke down. And I thought, have you sometimes trust in engineers is not correct. They also make mistakes. And he said, no, that was not a mistake of the engineer. He just made the wrong calculation. And so... Uh, and it's the same in medicine, as we all know. I was trained as a doctor, repairing things that were broken by surgeons, or nowadays discovering the wrong molecule and find a new treatment. But we also know that health is not only the human being, body being broken, but in a much more general way. So we need not only engineers and doctors, but we need a lot of others from humanities. And that's why I'm so happy that Peter Singer is here. Uh, we need even philosophers, I should say, to those who think that um, money should go to technology. A bit to my disappointment, uh, even philosophers, but also you manage to have to show they have value for something. Not that they have value in itself, but they have value for something. Value maybe for solutions here or solutions there. That's the case, it's how it is, but the, the person, I think, who can show that even philosophy has a lot of value for many things, is Peter Singer. Many of you, he, he doesn't need a lot of introduction. Many of you know him, otherwise you wouldn't be here, I guess. Uh, some know him uh, maybe from his book on animal liberation, other on practical ethics, um, yet others on altruism. Um, so very different fields, and there are many more. Um, uh, and, and I think uh, Peter Singer, as a professor in Princeton, a um, long time also professor in Melbourne, but having traveled all over the world, is, is a very good person to, to discuss with us uh, one of the major issues we may see. Uh, and I'm very curious to hear about overpopulation. Peter Singer, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Rector, for that uh, introduction. I want to thank uh, all of those involved in organizing this event and uh, putting it on in this uh, 
splendid location. This is actually the first time I have held a public lecture on the topic of population. Uh, it's still at an early stage of my thinking about this topic, and I'm therefore particularly looking forward to hearing from you uh, your reaction to this issue, because uh, I need to decide things for myself about how big an issue this is, how urgent an issue it is, what are ethical responses to it. And that's why um, there is a question mark after that too many people. Um, that's something that has to be asked, uh, and I'm not assuming that there are too many people, but I want to explore some of the reasons why one might think that there are and consider whether indeed those reasons justify reaching that conclusion. So, let's move on. Okay, that was not the first slide I was expecting. <laughs> Good, one more. Okay, and now we can go here. So, well, how do I come to this issue? Well, I come to it uh, initially through my concerns about global poverty. And this slide and the text here refers to the first article that I published on the question of what are the obligations of affluent people, and that really means us, citizens of affluent countries, with respect to people in poverty elsewhere in the world. Some of you may have read that article or other works. It uses a little story about a child drowning in a pond. This child fortunately is not drowning in a pond, but it's the closest I could come, looking at images that I could show you, even Google couldn't really find good images of children drowning, um, <laughs> hopefully because the photographer decided he needed to rescue, or he or she needed to rescue the child. Um, anyway, um, so I use this little story of um, if you were walking past a pond and you saw a child who had fallen in and seemed to be in danger of drowning, and you could save the child, but in doing so you would ruin your best shoes which you happen to be wearing and you didn't have time to get rid of them before jumping into the pond. Nevertheless, we would all think, I hope, that you ought to go in and rescue the child, that that would be the right thing to do. So I've talked about that many times over the more than 40 years since I first wrote that article and I've been talking about it again even more often uh, in the last 10 years since I started writing about effective altruism uh, and since that movement developed about people wanting to be more altruistic but wanting to know how to be more effective in their altruism. And, uh, but I started getting questions from people in the audience. I would talk to large audiences like this and they would say things like, well, you know, yes, I can see why you would want to save the child. I can see that that's good. But it's not just one child who's fallen into a pond. You've got to think about the world in which there are thousands of children teetering on the edge of falling into ponds. And you can pull this one out, but there'll be another one who falls in and you'll have to save them. And isn't really the problem that we have too many people on earth and we can't provide a good standard of living for all of those people. We can't provide enough food for them, or if we can provide enough food, we can't provide the basic level of health care which they need, or clean water, or sanitation. So really, instead of talking about saving lives, shouldn't we be talking about treating the root causes of global poverty, and isn't the root cause really the fact that there are too many people on this planet? So after hearing this again and again and giving responses to it that on reflection I thought didn't really go deep enough, uh, I decided I wanted to think more about this question and inform myself more about the issues. And so what I'm presenting to you tonight is the stage of thinking that I've come to about this. Okay, so poverty is one of the issues, obviously, that has led me to think about it. But it's not the only issue. A second issue is climate change. Now, I think probably here there aren't too many people in the room who are skeptical about the idea that the climate of this planet is warming. But 
I find when I'm talking in the United States, uh, I do find some who question that. Uh, and I use this slide, um, which shows the, the, the baseline here, the zero line, is the average temperature over this period, basically over the 20th century. And these lines show variations from the average in each year. And of course, the blue variations show where the temperature was below the average, and the red variations where it was above the average. And when you look at it this way, the pattern of warming is extremely obvious, right? That in fact, all of the years below around 1940, the temperature was below the average for this period. Then there was a bit of fluctuation, some years above, some years below, and then you get to all of the years from around uh, the late 1970s are above, and moreover, the trend is pretty clearly up. So this is a big problem, I think. I think we should accept this is real, this is happening, uh, it's continuing. If we don't stop putting more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, it will get much worse, and significant parts of the planet may become uninhabitable, unpredictable consequences will occur, this is a problem that we need to fix, we need to attend to. And again, is population growth a factor here? If people are using fossil fuels, uh, aren't they contributing to it? If we want them to get out of poverty and have a decent standard of living, won't they be contributing more to this? Can we really solve this problem while at the same time the planet's population is growing? So that was the second factor that led me to think about this. The third one was loss of biodiversity. Uh, the fact that, uh, sometimes as this title of this article puts it anyway, we're approaching the sixth mass extinction. When we look at uh, the history of our planet, there have been five previous periods in which there were widespread extinction. Um, it looks as if we have this upward jump around uh, 1900 or uh, in that period, where we're starting to lose more species, cumulative extinctions as percentages of the uh, species uh, evaluated by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And they've all turned up. Um, and so if we value biodiversity, again, we may say human population increase, human domination of the planet has caused extinctions to rise. And that's also a matter of concern. So these are the three factors that I'm going to each say a little bit more about uh, tonight, although only, as I say, relatively briefly. Good. So let's look at some facts about population itself now. Uh, the next couple of charts are based on the United Nations Population Division, which puts out this document called World Population Prospects. You can find it online. This is from the 2017 revision, the most recent one out. Um, they have three variants uh, when they're predict predicting global population. They have what they call the medium variant, the blue line, the high variant, of course, the red line, the low variant, the green. So, so there's an element of uncertainty about this, about where we're going to end up by the end of the century, 2100. But um, in this, uh, if we take the medium variant as the one most likely, it suggests that we are going to get around 11 billion people. Uh, it's a slight increase over previous years uh, that it's gone up by the end of the century, pretty much starting to level out by the end of the century. Um, maybe not totally, but close to stability, but still uh, rising for the century to come. So that's total numbers for the world as a whole. But that global figure, which some people might find somewhat reassuring, uh, others not, um, that global figure disguises very significant regional variations. And so this chart shows the growth in different regions. And what you see is that all of the regions are either pretty flat or topping out, um, except for one, this line here, 
which is Africa. So Africa's population is going to continue to grow right to the end of the century. Uh, Asia's population here um, is going to top out um, around, what is that, 2060 or something like that, the prediction is, and start to fall a little. Um, then we have all of the others here, which are pretty close. I guess North America is growing a bit. Um, Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean and Oceania and so on are not growing. So we're getting uh, a very specific regional growth. Uh, and the, so the next question is, well, is that in itself a ground for concern? And if so, what kind of concern is that? And we can look at some of the figures just to put figures on that. So here's the world, uh, 11, just over 11 billion by the end of the century. Um, and uh, Africa uh, is getting close to four and a half billion, which is a big jump from where it is today at uh, 1.25 billion, whereas Asia is not increasing much over that century and the, uh, some of the others are actually falling. <clears throat> and then we need to look at things more specifically. And I've put on this slide some countries where I've said causes for concern, again with a question mark, and there are different categories of countries that are on this chart. Uh, so one thing to note is that many of the world's poorest countries are on this chart. Um, and they, 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 those that I've selected, well, let me put it this way. Put aside the United States and Nigeria for the moment, okay? Let's not look at those figures right now. All of the other countries are countries that are predicted to quintuple their populations by the end of the century. So they're going to have five times, according to the UN, they're going to have five times their present population by the end of the century. And these are all very poor countries. They're all countries that are in the category of least developed countries. So Angola, Burundi, Niger, Somalia, Tanzania, and Zambia. So those are causes for concern on the poverty grounds in particular, you might say. Here are poor countries. We're trying to help them to get out of poverty but they're going to have five times the population by the end of the century. That means they're going to need five times the schools, five times the sanitation, uh, you know, five times the other infrastructure, health services, whatever that's needed. Um, is that going to be possible to produce that and to get those populations to a better standard of living than they are at today? So. That's why those countries are there, and those are countries that are fueling a lot of the uh, population growth. Then um, Nigeria is not quite going to quintuple its population. If you do the math on those figures, it's we're talking cl closer to four times its population. But Nigeria is particularly significant because it's the largest population in Africa today. So in terms of the number of people who will be added uh, Nigeria is responsible for the largest share of that. It's talking about 603 million more Nigerians than there are now. And then there's the United States. So why did I put the United States up here? That'll become clearer later on, but the United States is in contrast to the predictions for Europe, um, or Japan, say, or other countries, the United States is predicted to continue to grow um, and to add 123 million people by the end of the century. Um, a lot of that is through immigration uh, rather than natural reproduction, but uh, still it's a, it's a significant growth increase, significant for reasons I'll come to. So uh, in a way it's, it's these kinds of figures that I think if we, if we are to conclude Yes, there are too many people. We're not going to say necessarily that this is just global, but we may want to focus on particular countries and particular reasons for reaching that judgment. Okay. <clears throat> now, it's interesting that we haven't had a lot of discussion of this in recent years. By in recent years, I'm really talking, I guess, about the last 20 years, 25 years. Um,
because as I'll say in a few moments, we have had discussion in earlier periods. And one bit of evidence for this is the world has, uh, the UN has adopted, the world, if you like, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. They replaced the Millennium Development Goals, um, which were 20, uh, expired in 2015, and they decided to set a new set of goals. <coughs> so there's 17 of these goals, and each of them has specific targets within. So if you add up all of the targets, there are 169 specific targets that the nations of the world have agreed to try to meet as part of these sustainable development goals. And note the world's word sustainable is in there, and yet not one of these 169 targets or 17 goals refers to human, global human population. Not one of them. There is one reference to problems of increasing urban population, but it's, it's specific to urban populations. I think that's strange. I think that if we are talking about a sustainable world, it's strange that there isn't at least some discussion about whether population growth is compatible with sustainability, whether it's sustainability, compatible with the sustainability of some regions, perhaps. Uh, and I think it's part of the fact that this topic has become in some way taboo. Not that nobody talks about it, there are certainly individuals who talk about it, but at levels of public policy in many governments and particularly in these multinational, uh, multilateral bodies like the United Nations, like the World Bank, um, we don't have policy discussions of the desirability of slowing population growth or the fact that it's not necessary even specifically. Um, and we don't have international population conferences of the sort that existed during the 70s and 80s. So one of the reasons that I want to raise this topic is it seems to me that at the very least we should conclude that this is an issue that we need to talk about. Um, so to anticipate that conclusion. Okay, but there are reasons why people are not talking about them and I want to go through some of those and comment on them. One is that people who raised the alarm about population in the past have turned out to be mistaken. And you can go right back to Thomas Malthus at the beginning of this discussion, uh, end of the 18th century. Uh, Malthus argued that population increases geometrically you can see why he thinks that. So two people have four children, the four children and each have four children. You know, that's a geometric increase. Whereas he thought food production can only increase arithmetically. And I think he thought that because methods of growing food had not really changed for a long time in his day. You planted your corn, wheat, whatever it was. You had your sheep out there. You got as, roughly as many as much food to the acre as your grandparents had, had got to the acre when they were farming. Uh, and all you could do was extend your acreage. You could have a bit more land, but you couldn't do that geometrically. You were going to run out of land. So um, that's why he thought we were heading for disaster, that uh, we were essentially population growth would be limited by starvation. More recently, though, we had Paul Ehrlich, who published The Population Bomb, a very popular bestseller. You see here two editions of it. And look at the words that you can see on the cover. Population control or race to oblivion. That was the choice Ehrlich was posing. And then here, while you're reading these words, four people will have died from starvation, most of them children. And here the population bomb keeps ticking. And here you have, it's actually uh, grown while you're reading these words, five people, mostly children, have died of starvation and 40 more babies have been born. So pretty dramatic. And indeed the drama was contained in the inside of the book as well. The opening words of the book are, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. And he doesn't mean it's over because we can feed all of humanity. He means the battle has been lost. 
we will never again be able to feed all of humanity. And then he goes on to say, in the 1970s and 1980s, this book was published in 1968, by the way, it's its 50th anniversary this year. In the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death, and that won't even be the end of it, he says. Well, fortunately, that didn't happen. Hundreds of millions of people did not starve to death in the 1970s and 1980s. And in fact, in terms of per capita food production, although the population has increased significantly since 1968, but the world produces more food per capita even, even allowing for the expanded population, more food per capita than it did in 1968. So clearly the battle to feed all of humanity had not been lost then and has not been lost now. Ehrlich was just flat out wrong about that. And so therefore a lot of people will say, you see, these people who say there's too many people, they're alarmists, they get it wrong, we don't really need to listen to them. Well, my response to this is, yes, we should be much less confident than either Malthus or Ehrlich were. We should recognise that we might be mistaken, that there's uncertainty in predictions of the future. We don't know. But, as I said, I still think we ought to be able to discuss this. There should not be a taboo on it. And we ought to try to look at the evidence as to whether this is or is not a problem and make up our minds about that. Okay, second reason for not talking about it. We did talk about it, as I said, during the 1970s and 1980s, and there were a lot of population conferences and so on. But that produced a certain reaction, and some of the population programs that arose produced a hostile reaction. China adopted its one-child policy, uh, and that led to coercion, that led to people being forced, in some cases even to abort pregnancies, and certainly being coerced not to have children. And India adopted a program that, legally speaking, was not coercive, but because local officials were given incentives to carry out a number of sterilizations. <clears throat> in fact, at the local level, it quite often was coercive. So that produced a reaction that says, we ought not to tell people how many children they can produce. That's a violation of their human right to procreate. So this is a human rights advocacy approach that says, this is something for individuals to decide. If we're going to talk about population, we're effectively denying people the human rights they have to procreate. <clears throat> so I have um, a couple of responses to that. The first one is, in my view, this is representative of the ethical views that I would hold and defend, um, there, are no, there is no absolute right to unlimited procreation. Rights have to depend on at least some sense of consequences, at least some sense that if allowing people rights leads to catastrophe for all, then rights have to be constrained or balanced in some way. And <clears throat> if, as we now know, we live in a world in which greenhouse gas emissions have impacts on everyone, have harmful impacts on everyone, uh, then if those impacts are serious enough, the right to procreate has to be balanced against them. So I don't think you can just say there's an absolute right to procreate. Secondly, um, I think that there are things that we could do even if we were to accept that there is an absolute right to procreate. That is, there would still be things that we could do to change the number of people who will exist in the world by 2100 or some future date. Because some of those things do not violate anyone's right to procreate. So, for example, it's been clearly shown that the more years of education a girl gets, the fewer children she is likely to have. Obviously, this is you know, over 
it's not, it doesn't apply to every girl you educate, but taking large numbers and large samples, education has been shown to reduce fertility. So we could, for example, say, okay, well, if population is a problem, then let's put a lot more resources into helping poorer countries to educate females. Uh, and that would not violate anybody's rights. I don't think anyone would, would argue that it does. Um, increasing access to contraception would be another thing that, uh, in terms of a right to procreate, uh, would be totally consistent with the right to procreate. And I think that pr providing incentives to couples to have small families also does not necessarily violate the, the right to procreate. The, it may depend a little bit on the nature of the incentive uh, that you're providing and the circumstances of the people that you're offering the incentive to. Uh, so there's a, there's a possible grey area uh, where you might say, you know, let's say people are starving and you say, well, we'll give you food, but first you have to get sterilised. I mean, that's, that's not a free choice. Um, but, you know, between, between that and saying, uh, you know, if you come and get sterilised, we'll provide you with a, uh, some sort of minimum, you know, monthly uh, amount of cash or something like that. You know, that's, uh, that might be an option that you can provide um, that is still compatible with the right to procreate. Okay, so that's a, uh, another response. Okay. Now, the third reason, and perhaps the most uh, sensitive kind of reason for not talking about this, is reflected in the statistics that I showed you, which <coughs> suggests, at least in part, although my chart of countries did include the United States, for reasons I'm going to come to, um, did suggest that um, the, problem is, the problem of global population growth is, to a large extent, a problem of African population growth. <coughs> Excuse me. And that... <coughs> that obviously feeds into racist prejudices that many people, unfortunately, already have. <coughs> and it feeds into the history that we have, that Europeans have with Africa, which is also um, not a... Uh, a pretty story and which uh, has colonialist echoes of us telling them what to do. <coughs> so people can legitimately think that uh, this is a disguise for racism, for saying it's not really that there's too many people in the world, we just don't want the world to have so many Africans in it. And that is a serious reason that has to be taken into account that I think I have to think about. Um, <coughs> is what uh, we're going to say on this issue going to be used for racist and colonialist agendas. Uh, and I think you do have to think uh, hard about that. But I at least came to the conclusion that that should not deter us from speaking about the issue. Um, we should be pretty clear about the possibility that this can be misused and try and guard against that misuse. <coughs> but it's it's not a sufficient reason for saying that we just turn away from the problem and pretend that it isn't there, that there isn't a question about whether African nations will in fact be able to get out of poverty with the population growth that some of them are having, whether uh, we ought to protect, whether there's a problem about loss of biodiversity in that area, uh, whether it's going to have impact on climate change. I think those are real questions which we do have to address. <clears throat> but we have to do it properly, and this is uh, why the United States was in that original slide, right? If we're talking about climate change, then at least on present rates of greenhouse gas consumptions, those countries that I showed you that have very high rates of population growth also have very low greenhouse gas emissions. Whereas the United States has very high per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, 16.5 metric tons per capita as against some countries that don't even register um, to the nearest 0.1, Burundi, right, and uh, uh, Somalia, um, uh, and others that are 
very low, and even Nigeria is, is quite low. And um, the Netherlands, of course, is, is much closer to the United States than it is to these African countries. The Netherlands is, uh, the figures, last figures I saw, were 9.9 .9 metric tons per capita. So um, not as, not as, Europe in general is around that level, not as much as the United States, um, but still uh, making a significant contribution. But of course, the difference is that the Netherlands is not predicted to, for its population to grow in the way the United States is. And so this is what you do when you add up those population predictions and factor in the greenhouse gas emissions, right? So then you find that, that the United States relatively low population growth um, of 123 million over the next century adds 2 billion tonnes um, of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Nigeria's very large population growth over the coming century adds only 300 million tonnes, so 15% of what the United States is adding, and Niger's uh, even more rapid than Nigeria's population growth, though from a lower base and with significantly lower per capita greenhouse gases, adds a trivial amount compared to the United States. So if we're concerned about climate change, um, these figures suggest that the focus should be on the United States and on the Netherlands to some extent and on other countries um, more than it is on the African countries that I've talked about. Having said that, um, there is a caveat that needs to be made, and that is, can we assume, essentially, that the greenhouse gas emissions of those African countries will remain as they are now? And the answer to that is probably not. In fact, the, the figures that I just gave you uh, for those emissions are 2014 figures. I wasn't able to turn up um, more recent data. Uh, so it's quite possible that they've already increased to some extent. And in any case, we would hope that they would increase in one sense, right? We would hope that people in poorer countries would have more energy, um, access to the things that we take for granted, like electricity, electric light, and so on, um, which, with present methods of technology, is likely to mean more fossil fuel consumption. Now, of course, um, you, know, the, you might say, well, on the one hand, they'll continue to live. That won't happen. They'll continue to leave, live low energy lifestyles. Or you might say, no, because by the time they get to the point where they can afford more energy, we will have developed more efficient solar or wind uh, techniques for generating energy. And so they'll continue to have very low greenhouse gas emissions. I hope that's right. The ideal future would be one in which they have as much access to energy as we do, but it all comes from clean energy sources. But that's optimistic. And so you have to be prepared to take a certain gamble to be reassured here that uh, the additional numbers of Nigerians uh, is not going to have a significant contribution towards greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and you have to think about can we actually take that risk and what should we be doing about it? Clearly, I mean, one thing we ought to be doing about it is that the affluent countries ought to be reducing their per capita greenhouse gas emissions. I think that's, that's clear and I you know, need to say it, but I'm not going to go into it again. That's something that ought to happen anyway, whatever happens to population increase. But um, there's an argument for saying that even if that does happen, population increase will still end up being a problem. Uh, okay, so, um, you know, still, as I say, we need to have balance in this. And uh, I think we need to talk about uh, the projected increase in the United States. I think Americans who are concerned about, uh, about climate and the environment ought to be thinking about whether it's good for the United States to increase its population. Um, and that, in a way, is true whether it's natural increase or whether it's immigration, because immigration to the United States from poorer countries will lead to those people having a higher carbon footprint on present patterns of living. That may change, but especially under the Trump administration, there's no sign that it's going to change uh, 
quickly enough. Okay. Um, another question that I want to ask, this is in a way the, the, the more philosophical part of what I want to talk about, is how do we decide how many are too many? And there are some deeper value questions that I want to talk about now. So before I can talk about these questions, one question, there's a sort of factual question, broadly factual question, that needs to be addressed. And that is, what should we think about life for people in the poorer parts of the world, parts of the world where population is uh, growing fastest? What should we think about the quality of life of those people now? Should we think of it as, um, you know, not perhaps not as positive as ours, but nevertheless positive? Or should we think about it as negative, as people, many people at least, not obviously everybody in these countries, at such a level of, of poverty that um, their lives are not in themselves a good thing? That's, that's a difficult question. It's, it's not just a factual question. It obviously requires you to decide how you're going to judge <coughs> whether a life is positive or negative. But if we want to look at this and try to get some data on it, we can only do that through asking people questions. We don't have uh, a kind of happiness measuring stick. We can stick a thermometer into people's mouths and it'll tell us what their bodily temperature is, um, but we can't stick anything into them that tells them whether their lives are happy or unhappy, positive or negative, or anything of that sort. So what do we do? Well, we try and ask them questions. And there is now, over the last few years, there have been a, a body of researchers who are engaged in this, doing this. Um, obviously, there's a lot of difficulties. Uh, we're, you know, there are difficulties in doing it, even if you, if you do this kind of survey, let's say, in the Netherlands, in, in one country, there's enough difficulties. But if you're doing it globally, you have further difficulties. You have to translate, you know, you try to ask the same question to people all over the world, you have to translate it into their own language. Um, you also have, may have cultural variations in how people respond to questions. Uh, <clears throat> so that it's not clear whether the response to a question, even if it uses the same words or the words that you translate back into the language in the same words, whether it actually indicates the same, the same underlying quality of life that is what we're trying to get at. So this is in itself a, a really difficult issue. Let's come to this slide now, which comes from, uh, I've cut it off, some, something called the World Happiness Report. You can find it online, the most recent version of it. Um, and these, this responds to answers to a question which essentially says, imagine a ladder with 10 rungs on it where the bottom rung is the worst kind of life you can imagine and the top rung is the best kind of life you can imagine. Tell me where you think you are on this ladder. Okay? It's, um, it's, it's what's referred to as a sort of, or I, maybe, it's, maybe it's something like, tell me how satisfied you are with your life on, on, on this sort of scale. Right? Um, so what we get here then is these colours showing how people in particular countries, obviously averaged over the countries, answer this question. And to some extent, the answers are along the lines you might expect. Uh, there's very few people who are saying that they're as, as satisfied as they can imagine with their life, um, especially when you average over countries. But there was a number of people in this dark green category, um, including uh, places in, in Northern Europe, Scandinavia, you know what's going on there. Um, Canada, but not the United States, is interesting here at this, uh, in the dark green level. Australia and New Zealand both do 
quite well. Um, then you come down to the lighter green where you have basically the rest of, uh, most of the rest of Europe. Portugal's a little behind that. Um, and uh, the United States, Mexico, a lot of uh, South America. Uh, it comes down and then when you get to, so if five is the middle, you might say, this is you know, an interpretation, you might say, so five is the midpoint, so people who are below five are saying their life is closer to the worst life they can imagine, the best life, the most satisfying life. Um, and you might see that as being on the negative side of life. But that's, that's an interpretation that is not necessarily accurate. But anyway, when you, when you do look at that, you find that... Um, Many countries in Africa are, are below that five. Um, Nigeria here, the big country here, is an exception. Um, it's between five and six. So uh, by any stretch, you'd have to say Nigerians think their life is positive. Um, but uh, other countries in sub-Saharan Africa, many of them don't. Some of them are further down um, uh, here. So uh, I think this is the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so uh, you could say, well, there's at least places in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa where people think their lives are not positive. As I say, that's an interpretation. But that's only one question um, that gets asked. Uh, another question is um, asked in a different survey where people are asked... Um, Taking all things together, would you say you are, this is down the bottom here, taking all things together, would you say you are one, very happy, two, rather happy, three, not very happy, or four, not at all happy, right? Um, and this graph actually puts these two things together, the question I described before and that was shown in the previous slide, and this other question, which uh, asks people straight out, whether they're very happy or whatever. And it looks at the percentage of people in these countries who say they're very happy or rather happy. So the positive ones rather than the negative ones. Now, we don't have data from as many countries to this other question. Uh, and so, uh, you know, again, we, we, we get a reasonable amount of correlation between these, these two. It's not a perfect correlation. Um, but generally, the countries that did towards the top of the previous one, uh, over here with um, more than 90% saying they're very happy or rather happy, and that's true of the United States uh, and Australia and Mexico, but it's, it's also true of um, some uh, less well-off countries. Uh, so we have Colombia around here, um, Rwanda, uh, it's a bit of an outlier here, doesn't do that well on the ladder, between three and four, but does uh, gets over 90% here, so it's a little hard to explain uh, that result. Um, and if we're looking at other African countries that we have here, uh, other sub-Saharan African countries, we have Nigeria, which, as you saw, did positively on the other ladder, just between five and six, and has over 80% saying they're very happy or rather happy. <coughs> um, Ghana, which is definitely one of the, the better governed African countries doing relatively well, uh, is up there too. Zimbabwe, though, which we wouldn't think is doing all that well, um, uh, is up close to that level as well. And then, as I said, there's a lot of other countries that we just don't have the data on. So um, on this basis, you, know, you might say, well, it seems that even in quite poor countries like uh, Zimbabwe, um, most people are having positive lives. Okay. That's, that's a reasonable conclusion to draw, not uh, necessarily the right conclusion, but a reasonable conclusion to draw. Now, that gives rise to a philosophical question, which has been discussed a lot by philosophers in the abstract, um, but not very much in connection with the real world in which we live. And I want to get to that abstract level now because I don't think you can really discuss the practical questions I've been talking about without at least being aware that this question can be raised. Okay, what is this graph showing? These are imaginary worlds now, right? We're not talking about the real world. We're talking about hypothetical choices. And I'm asking you to compare different universes, 
right? So A, A plus and B are separate universes. They're not parts of the same world. At the moment, let me just talk about A and B. So in A, the universe consists of a billion people at, well, the zero jump, sorry. A billion people at a level 100, right, was the idea here. Um, so uh, by level 100, I'm specifying, let's say, something that is, is like that top, that rung 10 on the ladder before. So think of the, the best possible life you can imagine, you know, people are happy, they're not suffering, they're having rich, fulfilling lives, they're creative, whatever else you think goes up to making a great life, and they're all, they're all having that kind of life. Compare this now with, whoa, dear, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Compare this now with, with B, right? Um, in B, there are twice as many people, and they're still having very good lives. It's just they're not having quite as good lives as the people in, in A. Um, so there are some things that are not so good, but you could still think of this as, you know, a really, a really good life, the life of people who, let's say, are living in a well-governed country with uh, access to the things that they need. There are just, uh, you know, some, some constraints on, on their well-being, but they're still doing really well. And there are twice as many of them. Okay. So now the question is that I want you to focus on, suppose that you were able to create either of these universes. You can think of yourself as a divine creator, if you like. Um, if you don't want that hypothesis, you can imagine that we're in some other state now and you're a, a, government, you're a government bureaucrat and you have to make a decision between a couple of different policies with relation to population. One of them will lead to A and one of them will lead to B, if you prefer to do away with that, divine creators. Okay, so I would like you to tell me, by a show of hands, which of those worlds you would create, which is, and, and I presume this is because you think it's the better world. I'm asking you to think sort of as, as a, you know, what would be the most ethical decision here. Okay, so if you think that it would be better to create A in this situation, raise your hands now. Quite a lot of you. If you think it would be better to create B, raise your hands now. Significantly fewer, although still, a reasonable number, but definitely fewer. Okay, so B plus is there to challenge those of you in the majority, as I expected it would be, because this is not the first time I've asked this question. Um, if you think, I presume anyway, I presume that if you think that A is better than B, you also think that A is better than A plus, right? Is there anyone who put up their hand to say A is better than B, who doesn't think that A is better than A plus? I don't see anyone, and it would be strange. Okay, the question is, how can you defend the judgment that A is better than A plus? Let's assume that the, hundred, the one billion people at 100 are just the same people in A+, plus, they're just the same people who are in A, okay? So there, there they are, they're living these real, this really good life, um, and they're still living this really good life in A+. Plus. But the difference is that there is another part of the world where there's another billion people who are living a life that is still a good life, right? 75 is still a good life here. It's not as good as 100, it's not as good as 90, but, you know, they're, they're really happy to be alive. They're really glad that they're, that they're there and they're enjoying their life. And, in case this was putting you off A+, plus, um, it's not that they're like second-class citizens who have to clean the homes of the first-class citizens or something like that, right? It's, it's rather like, um, well, there were these people, 100, one billion people living great lives in Europe, and then somebody crossed the Atlantic and they discovered, gee, what do you know, there's another billion people over there in the Americas, and they're pretty well off, but they're not as well off as we are. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to help them, but we don't have the transport and we can't really do anything about it. Um, but, you know, 
Has the world now become a worse place? Or rather, they were there all the time. Do we now know that the world is worse than we thought it was because we've now discovered there's a billion Americans who are not as well off as we are? That seems pretty strange, doesn't it? I, I, find, that, I find it really hard to accept that having discovered this extra billion people, you now have to say, oh, the world is not as good a place as we thought. Why not? Well, because there's these other people who are not as well off as we are and there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, but they're still happy to be alive. They, you know, if you could wipe them out somehow, that wouldn't, they wouldn't want you to do that. So why is it bad that they exist? But if you agree with that, if you agree that A plus is not worse than A, right? I'm not necessarily saying it's better than A at this stage, but if you agree that it's not worse than A, then it seems pretty clear that if we now compare B and A plus, that B is actually better than A plus, right? Very hard to say that B is not better than A plus because B has the same number of people as A plus and they're better off. And if inequality was still worrying you, despite the fact that it's sort of a natural inequality you can do nothing about, if inequality was still worrying you, well, there's no inequality in B. So this is a, a paradox because many people have these intuitions that I think many of you had, that is that A is better than, than B, but yet, at least I've hope I've persuaded some of you that A plus is not worse than A and that B is better than A plus. So if A plus is not worse than A and B is better, that seems to suggest that B is better than A, surely. That's just transitivity of your judgments. Okay, so that's a reason for thinking that we should not go by average in judging whether a world is or is not a good place. So in other words, if somebody says, well, population, there are too many people in the world, why? Because the average level of happiness would be higher if there were not more people, or if, there were, you know, if, if we didn't have this expansion that's predicted by the end of the century. That in itself is not the end of the discussion. Because you need to say, yes, Let's, let's say you do accept this, let's say, I accept that the average level of well-being in the world will be lower if there are more people, but there will be more people, and there will be more people whose lives are still positive. Let's assume that they are positive, that's what I was going through the, the facts of that before. There will be more people whose lives are positive, and that in itself is a good thing. If you like, one way of putting it would be say there'll be a greater total amount of happiness in the world you want to think of it that way. So, so I think that question at least needs to be part of this discussion. It can't be ignored as I would approach the issue. But having said that, there's a further puzzle. Um, this work, by the way, I should, I should acknowledge, I, it's acknowledged on the next slide, I think, comes from uh, initially the, the major contribution was made by uh, a great Oxford philosopher called Derek Parfitt, um, a personal friend of mine as well, who sadly died uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, but if you want to look at it, uh, there's references down the bottom of this slide. Uh, work is called Reasons and Persons, uh, part four is relevant. But there's also a very good article about the whole issue in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is a free online philosophy encyclopedia. Uh, I do recommend. Now, what does this slide show? Well, it shows what Parfit refers to as the repugnant conclusion that if we take the view that I just tried to argue you into in the previous slide, that you can't assume that the best world is the one with the highest average level of well-being. If you were inclined to say, okay, I'm persuaded, what I want is the world with the biggest total amount of well-being, and just to look back, that's clearly going to be B, right? B has multiplied out, B has 180, uh, billion units of well-being, which is more than either A or A+. Plus. So what we want is the highest total. Well, uh, Parfit said, okay, then what about the comparison between A and Z? A is the same A we had before, right? A billion at a very high level, at 100. Z is a world with a huge population where life is still worth living, still has to be positive, but barely so, 
Parfit at one point described it as a life of Muzak and potatoes. So <laughs> that's all, all you get to hear is Muzak that you get in elevators and shopping centers and all you get to eat are potatoes. Not really good French fries either, you know, <laughs> just, just boiled potatoes. Um, still positive. So, but, but this seems, you know, the idea that you could replace a world and could even be a world of not just one billion but ten billion or however many you like, that there is some world that is large enough, some world that is large enough so that everybody existing on music and potatoes would still be better than this world of a billion or ten billion people living fantastically rich and creative lives, that's a little hard to take. So that's why philosophers don't regard this as a solved problem. Um, and there are still a lot of philosophers trying to think about what is, is there an answer to this problem? And if so, how should we address this problem? And I certainly don't have and will not provide you now with an answer to it. Um, I encourage you to think about it more and to read more about it if you're so inclined. Uh, but um, at least I think it's still, it's, it's, at least for me, it still isn't the case that the highest average is necessarily the best outcome. Okay, so that's one of the ultimate values that you need to think about before reaching a conclusion on this issue. And uh, I'm getting near the end now. There's one other kind of value. I talked early about biodiversity. So this is another value that we need to bring into the discussion. And it's difficult again to say how much weight we give to biodiversity when we're talking about, when we're comparing it with human well-being, uh, human life, more humans on the planet, and so on. So this is the kind of uh, iconic biodiversity uh, that we all talk about, uh, that we think about. Uh, the western black rhino is a subspecies of rhino that existed in the Cameroon uh, that is, apparently became extinct about five years ago. So it's one of the, it's not actually a whole species, but it's a subspecies that we've lost. Um, and uh, we may well think that's well, due to, or at least the population is associated with it or uh, consumer pressure is associated with it, it's probably poaching for rhino horn more specifically here, but also of course the fact that people in that area see the possibility of earning substantial amounts of money through supplying that need. But um, looking at it um, in a more scientific way, uh, this is uh, an attempt to associate uh, places where there are, we're here talking about plants rather than animals, where there are plants on the International Union of Conservation of Nature red list of threatened species, um, and putting that map together with places where there is high rate of population growth. Uh, so the highest population growth rates are the dark red squares, uh, the medium ones are the light red, and you see the number of, of plants that are endangered. Uh, so the reasons are not, uh, you know, this is a correlation, it's not providing causation, but it does show that there's a lot of endangered biodiversity in areas where there is rapid population growth. And uh, there are studies that suggest that there is causation here. Not this, not this chart in itself, but studies suggesting, and it's not surprising, I guess, that population pressure leads to clearing land, uh, to more pressure on nature, to loss of biodiversity. And so there is that question, how do we balance this up? Uh, does it, you know, are we going to say, well, it matters if uh, rhinos become extinct, um, but it doesn't matter if uh, plants become extinct, or it doesn't matter if plants that I wouldn't be able to recognise if I stumbled over them become extinct, which is, of course, the case with a lot of these plants. Um, what is it that we're actually valuing here? Um, and, and you get a whole range of different opinions in terms of that, uh, and also you then get questions about how much of this is a value. Is it a, a world heritage that we have in trust from our uh, ancestors and we, we need to pass on as intact as we can to our descendants? I think that's a reasonable way of looking at it. Um, and yet, 
at some cost, I guess, you know, what, how much cost should we be prepared to bear for the preservation of biodiversity? So that's another deep question which uh, I think needs to be part of the discussion, but which I'm not going to answer. And I am pretty much out of the agreed time now, so I will move to a conclusion, which is not very conclusive, however. Um, so, as I say, there are many questions that need to be asked. Some of these are que ethical, uh, factual questions, uh, like, you know, what are going to be the consequences of population growth for climate change? Uh, some of them are ethical questions. I haven't given you very many answers. The only conclusion that I'm firm on is that we should be able to discuss this. We shouldn't fear uh, that we're going to be labelled politically incorrect, uh, incorrect or contrary to human rights or uh, aiding uh, racist and neo-colonialist views. Uh, I think it is time to have a, a serious discussion of the issue. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can take it. Well, thank you very much for this lecture, but also for taking us with you on a journey uh, with research that you've just started. Right. Um, I'd like to go into the inconclusive conclusion, of course, <laughs> because I think it's, um, uh, you've been very careful not to draw conclusions at this stage yet. Um, you've, you've asked, are there too many people? Are there causes for concern? concern? What are the deep values? Uh, you don't have the answer to it. But I think, of course, in some, at some level you do. Maybe not as a philosopher or as a researcher right now, but as a person, for sure. Um, so I would like to know something about that. Do you think there is overpopulation at, at this stage? Is it the main cause <laughs> for, <laughs> for the problems you've stated? Uh, look, I, I'm, I'm quite genuine that I have not made up my mind about, about this issue. Um, I, I, did f I, I, I should say that when I was drawn to look at the, the figures uh, that I put up um, for predicted population growth of, of some of the poorest countries in the world, um, I do find that alarming. I, I am very concerned about trying to eliminate extreme poverty in the world. We are making progress, despite the growth that we've had in the, you know, recent decades. Perhaps surprisingly, despite that, We've made progress in reducing the number of people in extreme poverty. Uh, it's, it's below a billion now. For many years, the, the figure quoted was about a billion people live in extreme poverty, and that was based on World Bank data. Um, but currently, the World Bank says it's something like, I think, 760 million was the most recent figure that I saw. Um, so about 10% of the world's population. So that's good that we're making that progress. Uh, now... Can we continue to make that progress um, or are we going, you know, in a moment where we're going to run out of ways of continuing to overcome poverty uh, and if the countries that I listed continue with their high rate of growth, we'll fall back again. Uh, I'd have to say that I am concerned about that. Uh, I think that we would have a better chance of eliminating extreme poverty if, in fact, population growth were... You know, perhaps still continuing, but not at that really quite high rate that yes. is predicted to continue. And, 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 and if you would have to range it within uh, certain development goals, it doesn't have to be the UN development goals you were talking about, but um, uh, so as to say uh, limiting consumptions for, for uh, the Western uh, countries or the USA, uh, limiting greenhouse gas, gases for Europe or... Uh, the US, could you range where overpopulation would be then for you? Or looking at population at least? <clears throat> well, at present, um, for, for if we're specifically talking about climate change, I think consumption is, is a much bigger factor <coughs> Sorry. Um, than population. So, so I would s still place uh, the real burden for action on the affluent countries, uh, and I'm including China now in the affluent countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, not all of China is affluent, clearly, but, but um, several hundred million Chinese count as affluent now. 
um, and are approaching consumption levels of Europe and North America. So uh, I think that's where, if, if we were just focusing on climate change, that's where we would need to take the most action um, yes. and, and very urgently. Um, you know, and in some countries there's political will to take action and at the moment in the United States there's not and that's a, a real tragedy and uh, it's very, you know, we can only hope that that is going to change um, within the next two or three mm -hmm. years. Do, you, you spoke very briefly about uh, our colonial past and the fact that we shouldn't be afraid to address this s subject even if we are seen to be colonialist. Um, do you think that maybe um, one of the reasons why we should take on consumption first is also because we have to uh, make an effort uh, to do something ourselves instead of telling the people we've exploited for so long <laughs> what to do? Um, so I certainly do think that we need to do more ourselves, but um, I tend not to be backward looking in yes, my ethics. Yeah. Um, I tend to look at rather the, imp the difference it will make. And I think uh, where countries have a lot of people in poverty, uh, the gain that you get by getting them out of poverty is a much greater gain in terms of well-being than the losses that we would suffer if we significantly reduced our consumption in ways that would dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So, so for me, it's not so much that we should feel that, well, we, we exploited them in the past. It's rather that it's easier for us to reduce our lifestyle just a little bit. And, you know, I don't even know that it would really be a sacrifice. We would, would have a different type of lifestyle, but it could still be just as rewarding or more rewarding one. Whereas for people who actually don't have electricity, say, um, to be able to have electricity in the home, uh, is just a bigger a bigger gain. 